All right, welcome everyone to Conversations with Dr. C. Normally what we do is I highlight people that I have met or have had conversations with, and today I get to welcome someone who I've had numerous conversations with. Um, and so today we're just gonna talk um, about leadership in general. We're gonna cover a couple topics about um, deciphering your leadership style, um, also about evaluating employees. So our objectives today are one, to talk about leadership styles, to talk about various leadership styles, how to recognize those within yourself. Um, again, your own leadership styles, list the factors why building a team. How do you do that? What do you think about when you're building a team? And then lastly, we're gonna talk about the importance of evaluation in an educational environment. So today I am welcoming Dr. Jeff Killian. Um, and Jeff knew me long before I was a doctor. I wasn't anything. I didn't even have an associate degree when Jeff met me. So um, he's definitely kind of watched me climb the ladder. So I'm really excited to have him day today. Dr. Killian, I'll let you introduce yourself. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. My name is Dr. Jeff Killian. I'm the, currently the dean of the College of Health Science and Human Services here at Midwestern State University. And um, I've known Mary for many years, as we've mentioned, and uh, I started my career off at uh, up in Iowa, of all places. I went to first to a hospital-based program in Colorado, and then uh, ended up coming to school here at Midwestern, where I'm currently, and then uh, got a degree and ended up in Iowa as program director for about eight years. And and right now at Midwestern State, I'm starting my 21st year. Unbelievable. That's crazy. So I asked everyone the same questions that come and kind of talk to me, just to give us a little bit of idea about yourself. Um, so what did you want to be when you grew up? Like, obviously, as a little kid, no one's like, I'd like to be a dean of health sciences. Um, so what, what did you want to be when you were little? When I was little, there was probably three things I was oscillating from. First was a rock star. <laughs> and then the second was probably a truck driver, and then the third was a farmer. All right. Well, you've achieved rock star status. How about that? <laughs> we'll give you that one. Um, so, all right. Um, how about describe your first job and your first boss a little bit? Because I think those are pretty, pretty monumental experiences in terms of anyone who goes on to leadership roles. So tell us about your first job and your first boss. I don't know how far back you want to go. <laughs> it's very how about your very first x-ray job, your very oh, first okay. x-ray boss? The very first x-ray job, I kind of, as I mentioned, I went to a hospital-based program. And then from there, my instructors were were coming to school down in Midwestern. So I decided to follow in their footsteps. And then after I graduated, I put resumes out to the states where I, I had family. Well, I had family in Iowa and ended up in Esterville, Iowa, of all places, sight unseen. I took the job. It was, a, it was actually a twofer. I worked full time at the hospital and part time at Iowa Lakes Community College. I, and like I mentioned, I didn't even go up and, and interview. They did all over the phone. I had no idea what it was like. So I, I got up there and, uh, and my first kind of uh, boss, she was, I guess, more of the laissez faire. It was kind of a free for all. And, and someone being fresh out of school, that was great. But I don't know how great of an employee I was at that time because you could pretty much do it whatever you wanted. So that kind of had influence on me down the road. And then I'm going to jump to my second job was at Iowa Central Community College, which was about a year later. I went to the Iowa Central Community College and that was in Fort Dodge, Iowa. And from there, my my boss uh, became more of a mentor. Her name was Connie Boyd and, uh, and she was more of a mentor. So we would meet regularly and then we would read leadership books and then we talk about it. And so so I went from one one aspect to the other, or one side of the scale to the other, with kind of a leadership styles, or from from a boss perspective. That's great. I think it's a great example too. On you get what you like from those people around you. Like if one person is just very laissez faire, eh, whatever, whatever goes, then that's kind of the, what you adopt. And then when you're with someone who pushes you a little bit more, you adopt that. So I think that's a, a great, great piece there. And a shout out to our Central Community College. <laughs> I dropped my daughter off there last week. Ooh. So I know, I'm so proud. I was like, and I'm like, you should get something because your mom's an alumni. Yeah, that's, that's right. 
So shout out to them. Um, I'll go ahead and bring us into our first bullet point here. Um, right. It's about describing leadership styles. So I think it's a common question that if you apply for an upper, upper level administrative job, if you um, are in a leadership arena, you're going to get asked, you know, um, what is your current leadership style? So I'm going to ask you that, that general uh, question. How would you describe your current leadership style? I would describe it as that the transformational. That's, that's what I've, it's evolved into that, but my current leadership style is transformational. And so um, uh, kind of what I try and do is, it, is it's kind of twofold is adapt to the situation or, or what you're in, but also I try and aspire others and, and get them excited about their job and, and get to that high level performance through an encouragement. But uh, um, with the transformational kind of, kind of goes back to, I have to wear many hats trying to decide which buttons do I push on people because no two people are like that underneath me, right? I, now I got seven different departments. I've got seven chairs and a total of like 110 faculty under underneath me. But for the chairs and things, I treat them a lot different. And then each, even each one of them a little bit different. It depends on their maturity, where they're at in their career, and what their goals are. And so you wear different hats to try and, I find which ways to motivate and inspire each of them. And, uh, and then same with down the line for the, the faculty. And then I okay. guess, oh, yep, go ahead. I, and I don't know if it really falls into a, a, a leadership um, kind of a definition, but um, kind of the emotional intelligence and that kind of feeds right into that, uh, the, the different areas of, of how I look at myself through, I guess there's, they talk about four different areas of, of self-awareness, uh, social awareness, uh, self-management, and the last one, relationship management. So those are kind of, I guess I weave those two together and, and, and that's my current style. <laughs> that, that sounds perfect. Um, you talked, I know we learn a lot about EI and we talk about a lot of that. I think I've done a lot of training. So let me ask you, um, you said that it has evolved and you adapt to each person. So if I'm sitting across you from the first time and I'm a new department chair and I'm sitting across you from the first time, what do you do to interpret what type of leadership style that you need to take with me? Or how do you, how do you read the room kind of in simple terms when you have to deal with someone? The, I guess the biggest thing, what I try and do is just listen, ask questions and listen. So you can ask questions or um, ask what their leadership style is, or where do you see the department going? Or do you have a feel yet? And if you don't, what are your plans or your actions to learn the department or the are the people in your department or your students? So I, I ask certain questions like that and just listen. And where if someone has the maturity and you're like, oh man, they're spot on. They're they're heading this down the right road or where and then also I listen to where if I give some first I start off giving like slight suggestions where I'm implying you should go this way. And if you pick up on that and think okay, yeah, that's something good I need to incorporate. Then I know pretty much that, okay, I can use a gentler hand and, 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 and kind of help move you in this way. And then if someone that's just totally going off the rails, then you might, okay, <laughs> I, I'm going to have to tell you, here's point A, here's point B, here's point C. You need to connect these dots and then we'll, we'll visit again. So uh, the biggest thing, I think the key is just listen and then interpret. <laughs> I like listen and interpret, and I like the I've had those conversations too. I'm like, oh, we are not even on the rails. Like uh, we, we got it. We got to like yeah. pick you up, put you back on the rails. That's great. Get back on track. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> how about you said that is your leadership style has evolved into this style? How did you know that you needed to evolve, or what what happened that made you kind of evolve your leadership style? I think the first, as I mentioned, it started off. At a, in, in Iowa, and I was pretty young. I was 20, 23 at the time, and then as Marino, I was, became the program director at Fort Dodge, and I was about 24. But that age, I had no idea. And I had a few mentors, but not really in, in the education realm. I had a teacher that was a, a mentor to us, Jack Barr, Mary knows Jack too. So I kind of had that, and that was my, my kind of my placeholder. But when I started off, I was at the point where I was young. I just wanted people to like me. So you were the friendly, and then and then you'd think, oh, they they really didn't mean to either break that rule or that person really they're not really taking advantage of me. So you're I think between being naive 
and want people to like you because that's the way you thought you're going to be accepted. And so, and then over the years, I found out, boy, people will, just like we mentioned before, if, if you expect this, you're going to get that. And so if I didn't expect much, you just want to be friends. Well, that's exactly what I got. But as, as soon as you start putting goals or, or in, now the, the easiest thing is, is follow your policies and, and your goals and, and you stay on, on that track or that line and then you just enforce them. And, and so it's evolved over as you get more confident and learn more. And I think as you're, I think emotional intelligence is something that it's experience. And then that you, you keep, you get all the experience and put that file card in your head and then you know how to react to different situations or at least if you got a new situation, you can know how to process it and come up with some good, good answers or good pathway to, to follow. That makes sense. I told my poor students that this morning. I'm like, I'm sorry, but you guys are like my fifth kid. Like, I know all the rules that you're going to break. I know. I'm like, I'm, so I'm like, so you do. You live and learn with experience. And I had to, um, I had to admit today that I've been teaching X-ray longer than one of them has been alive. <laughs> so I'm like, yeah. I've been doing this a while, guys. You know I mean, so you do, you can like pull from that index of experiences and things like that. Um, so. <laughs> Besides experience, what tools or techniques maybe would you suggest to someone or do you use, if I had to define my leadership role, what if what if somebody asked me that and I had no idea? Um, I don't know what to say. I don't know where to look to go. Um, where would you send someone if they didn't know how to answer that question? I think for, I think a lot of people that's true because I don't know, I read a lot of books. So that's why I'd first kind of tell them, let's read some leadership books or read about leadership just in general. Because so many of us, I think even myself, I the transformational, I didn't know it was called that. That was just what I adapted into. And then, oh, here's a word that puts me in that box kind of. And uh, so I think first you need to kind of read and learn. Another thing is hopefully get a mentor of some sort. Find someone that that you think is a good leader that you have access to and, and can visit with that person. Because I think that's where if you can brainstorm or at least be able to visit and chat with someone and that helps give you the confidence of, okay, here's the situation. Here's how I'm thinking about handling it. And you can and kind of learn from them of, well, maybe not, or you should, but it gives you some point of reference. Otherwise, I think if you don't know the different leadership styles, you kind of do like me, I just kind of aimlessly and, and then, oh, look, this, this fits. But, and I guess the other thing would be, you need to look inside you, what are your strengths? And uh, for, for me, <laughs> I always tease people, it's like, I'm not the brightest bulb around, but I do have an intuitiveness or uh, where I can sense what's going on or read a room. So I, I, I go on my senses to try and decide more. So you need to find what is your leadership skills and then, then evolve or, or be able to adapt that to your advantage and then how to maybe uh, be able to um, influence others or, other, or lead others. But you have to find out what you're good at and then go on those strengths because if you try and be something you're not, you're not going to be a very good leader. Yeah, I agree with the reading. I case studies helped me the most to figure out what type of leader I was. So um, they came with like, of course, you took like I call them like the Cosmo quizzes, like in the magazine. <laughs> you know, I'm an X Y Z. Um, but once I got down to reading the case studies and how someone who does this type of leadership style really responds in a situation, that's probably when I when I was able to kind of focus down what type, what type of leader I am. So that's, that's great advice. And there's lots of books out there and there's lots of inventories. I think also once you keep reading and taking inventories of yourself and it comes up the same, um, when I first started doing all of that research for uh, my PhD, which is in, in leadership, I would get different answers every time. And I'm like, <laughs> well, how am I supposed to decide? <laughs> so I think that's a great point on being true to yourself, because I think sometimes I, I was answering those questions thinking, how should I answer these? What's the best way to answer this? What's the best way to handle this? So I think being being true to yourself and making sure that, you know, you're it's easy to represent yourself once you figure out who you are. So yeah. I think I think that's a great tip. Um, how about for someone who has to go into that initial interview and describe their leadership style? What do you have key points you think they should hit? Or what, what would you be looking for if you were if you were hiring someone and you asked them to describe their leadership style? I think the key thing when you bring someone in, I want to know can they fit in with the department that I have already or that office? And so can they work with other people? And so again, the listen part, but if, if you're coming in, make sure 
I think you should be able to to kind of project that you're able to adapt and work with different people, different leadership styles, and that you're you're going to be a team player. And so if you can kind of show me those things that otherwise sometimes you people come into an interview and if they've got kind of an agenda or or come across and well, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. It's like mm, you've already set in your brain the way you're going to go and and we kind of alluded to it earlier, it just takes one person or one bad apple to influence the rest of the group and it can it can knock yourself off or your train off the track as we've been saying. So adaptability, I think that's a good thing. Willingness to learn and uh, and that goes far. If, if you if you come in and say that I don't have all the answers but and, and willing to learn because every place is going to be different. It's going to adapt. We're going to change. We're not going to sit still. That's the other big thing. We need to change. And uh, I think those are the, the key things that, that, and then be able to work. But I really look at the fit. There may be someone that's got more degrees, um, more experience, but if, if it looks like they're going to have that personality that's going to gel well and help the group as a whole, I'll hire them over, over other people. I like your comment too, because I think sometimes we're expected to have all the answers. Yeah. Like you feel like you get to a certain level of leadership, you get a certain degree, you get whatever letters behind your name. And all of a sudden you feel like I need to know every answer to everything. And sometimes I get the most respect and the most feedback from people when I look them straight in the face, boy, in true full transparency. I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't have any ideas. But like you said, as long as you create that willingness to be open and to learn and to think about it, you, you don't have to have all the answers at your fingertips. I mean, you can you can learn and grow at the same time. That's a book the internet are for. <laughs> you can go out of research and find the answers. I'm good with that. Um, how about building a team? So say that someone came to you and said, Hey, we have we have project A in which, you know, we're gonna we're gonna build a cathedral or or something. They came to you with a project. How do you put together a team? Um, and, and what does that look like to you when you put that team together? If you if you have a task and all of a sudden you've got to got to come up with people to do it, how do you how do you come up with those people? I guess at first I look at what the task is and what are here's our tax and then what are the goals? What are what what are we gonna accomplish uh, accomplish with this team? And then I start looking around of who has the the knowledge that will be able to help move this team this team forward. And then, and then you have to also look at, I look at who are the real strong individuals who are, you got your type A, your type B, and then, and then, because if you have all a bunch of type A's, they're gonna do this for the longest time. So again, what's my timeline? What's, what are we trying to accomplish? And that's gonna be where I kind of decide who's gonna go. And then I try and, and get a variety. Otherwise for like our, here in health sciences, human services, we got, I mentioned before, we got seven different departments. I can't be too heavy in one area, otherwise it seems like I'm favoring them or they don't have the kind of the, the ideas or, or perspective of the other group. So I try and get a wide group too from each area and, and that depends on your situation. You may have a small group, so it'd be a little different, but it's something to keep in mind that you don't wanna leave anybody out. And so you want to make sure that that kind of people have a voice or at least understand or at least put out the question of like if you have a smaller group and you're kind of going get feedback from those other people that weren't included so but so first i would look at at the, the group <laughs> their personalities what we needed done so their expertise and then kind of decide the number and, and the goals from there i think that's great too i think um i tell people that too i think when you initially want to put a team together, you want you think about if I'm gonna if I'm gonna pick you know the top five people who know about the color green, I pick the top five experts about the color green. Well, they might not get anything done because they're all expert experts. I'm like, you don't have to pick this highest level achievers and put them all on one team. <laughs> like it's okay to spread it out. Um, and I think that's where it's important to know your strengths too. Because if you don't know my strengths, you can't assign me. You can't do that. Um, so I think that's good too, that people make, sh make sure that you have an answer to that when someone asks you, what are your strengths? What are you good at? Um, and make sure you offer everything. Like we were on a, a committee the other day um, about landscaping. And my first major in college was actual horticulture. <laughs> I know, I don't love radiology my whole life. I do now, but um, so I'm like, well, I'd, I'd love to be on that team. You know, I'd love to volunteer for landscape or for a greenhouse, you know, so 
I think it's a good, make sure you don't limit yourself when you share your strengths. I, mm -hmm. I, I love that. Um, how about, do you have to, if you evaluate those strengths, what if I come to you and say, hey, I'm really great at horticulture, but yet I took one semester of classes. <laughs> um, <laughs> how, do you, how do you evaluate people's strengths once they tell you that they have those strengths? Once I learn of someone, then I, I won't just put them, okay, you're in charge of this. Usually, if hopefully you've got a project or, or a group or something going on where, well, let's see how much they do know or where they are. So you can kind of judge. And so I try, I never try and set up anybody for, Failure. So that's why, I, I, even though you, you may have that degree or, or you say, I've got this in the horticulture, but let's let's kind of let's test the waters a little bit and see where they're at. Because I think success breeds success. So if you get if you know where they're at or can build on what you judge where, OK, they know this much up to this point, then we'll get them the tools that they need for the rest of the way. Or if they got it. All right. Good. They're successful. But I, I try and find successes for people. Because I really believe that, uh, like I mentioned, success builds success. So first, kind of test the waters, give them a little project that that maybe isn't mean as much, or or they've got a group around them, so you know that group they'll do okay, they're going to do fine, and then I can judge how that person performed. Because in my groups, I kind of like to um, let them first put them together, form it, and then that's where everybody kind of kind of maybe just some brainstorming and things like that. And after a while, I like to assign tasks. Who's going to do what, or at least, or have them tell me who's going to do what. I try and give them that empowerment. And uh, and then from there, once I know everybody's purposes and their thing, then I can kind of see how they do or they with the, the, the project or the tasks I give them. I like how you break that all down. I like when you start with a little bit of a task and you make sure you either assign tasks or they come back to you with feedback. Um, so I think I think those are really great points. Um, I want to move on to evaluating faculty and staff. So give us a rundown of what your current process looks like um, if you are going to evaluate someone. Currently, I'll start with the, the staff. That's kind of a, you have to do it at least yearly. Uh, for each staff and and uh i sit down and and like if it's their their very first year then we'll sit down and i'll come up with some uh, mutual goals we'll talk about what they're what they what they would like to achieve where they want to go and a lot of times staff I mean, they're wanting to to either move up get degrees and I, so i try and encourage that we try and look at where do you want to go so then i have at least three goals and then no more then five usually three seems to be the kind of the the, the sweet spot because then you don't overwhelm. But so so then over the next year, besides the montane kind of uh, their duties, what everybody's got job description with those just the regular things. So then I kind of look to see okay, like for staff, are they answering the phone? Are they keeping the budget going? Check check check. I mean those are kind of easy. But then I want to look at okay, here's the goals that we came up with that like. Uh, you were going to help um, maybe put a workshop on for some of the other uh, other secretaries or administrative assistants. And uh, did you do that? And then did you do, if you did do that, were we able to to learn from it? Were we able to teach it? Did it help? So I, I kind of evaluate those goals. So I, I can break it up. When I'm getting to the long run. Like I look at the mundane things and then also the goals. And did we ever achieve those things? Because that kind of shows that they're going to go up above and beyond. If you just... If someone can be like, I guess if we're talking about students, like you got that C student, they do good. They're going to all day long, they do what's expected, but they don't go up above uh, to do it. So I guess where if an employee or the staff in that case goes up and above, then that that gives me some direction where I can give them if we do raises or at least my, my score of them. And, and that goes to HR so far. And the faculty, a little different. With that, it's a kind of a, it's kind of a same deal where the faculty evaluate themselves. They put together a self report, and at our institution, it's in three different areas. It's your your teaching. Are you innovative? Do you do, you do a good job with the students? Do you collaborate? Things like that. Um, then the, then the next is research. Are you doing presentations? Are you are you writing? Are you getting published? And last is service to the the college, university, and and the community as a whole. So there you got some three definite areas and the and the faculty put together their own self reports. And so then you can judge from there. And then usually what I like to do is the same kind of thing at the end is uh, what are your goals? I'm more, I'm interested in where do you want to go? How do you want to achieve this? And I'll help you do that. Cause if you, if you just look at the, 
kind of the, the rope stuff, then you never know what those aspirations that person wants or if they want committees or what they're good at, like we mentioned before, and then where do they want to go? So if you want to move up and or whatever, then let's get you those tools because otherwise they're not going to be happy. So I try and get them empowered and then help them achieve those goals. Then you have, I think, good, good employees. Okay. How about, um, do you participate in any peer-to-peer -peer evaluation? So do faculty evaluate faculty, do staff evaluate staff? What do you think about that? I, I like it a lot. We don't do that here, but I encourage it. I, I try and, some, especially for the faculty that are brand new, they're coming in and I say, well, pick someone or, or I can pick someone, but have either, I usually sign them a mentor and, the, and we kind of do two things here. The university wants to sign them an official mentor and that's usually someone from outside the department and they can, they can talk to them freely is the idea. Well, they don't know that person from, from anybody. So usually I find someone within our college that I know they'll be a great kind of informal mentor that they can talk to. And so I set it up that way. I go, this person's never going to talk to me. I won't know anything. So have that person maybe evaluate how you're teaching. And so, and it's, and I try and, People are so afraid of how they they're perceived or look. They're afraid to fail. If you and so I try and set up that this is a safe place. You're new. It's okay to fail. If you're trying you, and you're doing a good job, it, that's perfect. And so get input from people around you. So if you feel comfortable with that informal mentor I've signed, or if you if you've made buddies with one of the other faculty members, have them give you an honest opinion and don't be hurt if they say, "Well, you really suck at this." That's okay. That gives you something to work on. And, uh, and it shouldn't be threatening. It's when people are threatened, they're thinking, oh boy, then they don't grow as much. They're too busy, like you mentioned before, they're pretending something they're not, or if, even though they've got that degree, you've got to learn. I always tell people, uh, <laughs> you, you, first time you got on a bike, you didn't go out popping wheelies and riding with no hands. You either had mom or dad pushing you and hanging on or you're training wheels on. It takes time to, to get better at whatever your job is. I love that. I think, I think those are great analogies. So that's perfect. Um, I also I like peer-to-peer -peer evaluation. I've participated in the past, and I've always gotten really good feedback from it. And sometimes they say things, and I have to go back to my office, and I'm like, how did I miss that? Or like, how was I not seeing that about myself? So I think it's a it's a great too. Um, how about do you have a piece or question of evaluation process that you think gives you the best sense of that employee's performance? Like if you could pick one one method out or, or one piece of it that really would give you an encompassing idea about how that employee is performing? To tell you the truth, I guess it'd be informal. I'm very, I, I, I'm very hands-on, I should say, or I walk around, I look at things. And so if I wanna see them in action. I wanna see how the students react to them, even walking in the hallways. Um, you can look at their evaluations. That's one thing if you get, so that would be outside evaluation of students. So I look at those, I take, because students are usually brutally honest. <laughs> and uh, and a lot of times what I do is like, they're brutally honest, but some, if they if they got a poor grade, then they'll usually mark them bad. So you take away the top, take away the bottom, usually right in the middle is the truth. But so I like to see how they perform, how they interact. Um, even, even in, uh, I don't know, I should say when you're at a, events or something, how they interact with others. I mean, so that gives me a sense of how they're getting along and then, then of course, I mean, you see how they're teaching their classes and are the staff, do they get the, the as I mentioned before, those mon mundane things do. But I guess my the biggest thing I do is I, I watch and I wanna see how they're doing. So I guess it's an informal evaluation of how they're doing in their classes, how they teach. Are they being innovative? Are they are they just standing at the podium? Or are they getting them in groups? Are they getting them excited? Are they doing research projects with them? Um, do they include them with things? So there's there's different things that, so <laughs> I guess when they'll say that someone's always watching, someone's always watching. Great, now I'm nervous. <laughs> um, I think that's a great piece of the puzzle. And I think it's a piece of evaluation that people don't think about very often. Like, I think you're always looking for that, you know, scale of one to three, or you're a three, so you're great. So I think the informal part of it is a really great um, idea and perspective to look at. I, I agree. I am, I recently interviewed for a job and I had all the general questions, all the normal, you know, what are your strengths, what are your leadership style, things like that. Um, but I took the most out of the campus tour. Yeah. because the person who was showing me around 
knew someone's name. They knew how to unlock the door. Like they knew, like they had been there before. It wasn't if they were walking into somewhere that they had never been. So I agree that that informal um, process, I did, I took the most from that interview from watching that, that person interact with others and how, how much they were well connected with that institution that really, I, I went home and I'm like, wow, that was great. So the, the informal process is there's something to definitely be said for it. Um, so how about that difficult conversation when you, let's say as, as I'm a member of your faculty, I give myself all fives out of fives, I'm doing a glowing, awesome job, and you're just getting feedback all over the place that this is, this is not what's actually going on. How do you start that conversation with someone? Oh, those are always fun. <laughs> not, not really. No, not fun at all. But what I try and do is before I meet with them, I come down or I list down things that what what are they doing right? What are they doing wrong? Or what's what is the issue here? A lot of times I try and preface it with um, it's not the person I'm we're looking at. We've got this behavior going on. So it, it, I try and separate that because people take so many things. Oh, they don't like me. They hate me. No, you're 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 not doing this. And so we need to correct that. So I try and write those things down. And I, and I start off the meeting with that, like, you're, you're great. We like you, you're doing these things, but, but we have concerns or I've got concerns in, in these areas. And so when I, I try and do a step process, I don't, I hate when people get blindsided. You see a lot of times where, especially in upper management, it seems like all of a sudden someone's just yanked from their position or, or I just don't like that, that management style. I like to give someone a chance to, to improve. So the first meeting we'll meet, here's here's the, what you do good, but here are our deficits. And so then I'll I'll outline those and then we'll come up with a, a plan. What's our plan, our action plan? So in three weeks, three months or whatever, I'm gonna meet you back here and we're gonna talk about these things that you're lacking and, and we'll come up with ideas. Here's how I think you can improve. How, how do you think you can improve or, or what do you see wrong in this area or what do you see that you can, how you could, uh, remedy this and so I kind of start there so we instead of just a one-on-one -on -one looking them in the eye saying you, you're you're off with this 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 that I try and give them an out is what I but it's kind of eases it okay here's here's our plan we're going to agree on this we're going to sign this that this is our plan moving forward and then then I put in there too that if our plan doesn't move forward here's the outcome I, I may have to let you go and so here, here's what's on the table and how you want to move forward, uh, we can do this. And if, and like recently I had one person, they just didn't have the skills. So then I set up training for them or even sent them to training. So let's, let's give them what we can do. If they're worth keeping, if you, sometimes you do have those people that they just, they, I don't know another word for it. They, they fight in the system. They're not a good fit. They don't want to be here. You don't want them here. Then just do the one, two, three. <laughs> Verbal, write them up, go on. I mean, but I try and try and always do the other route, give them benefit of the doubt. But sometimes you don't have that luxury. I do like the, I like people to leave with tools and resources. Anytime yeah. I have to have a conversation with you that you need to improve something, you need to do something better, I at least want you to leave with how we could do that. Yeah. Instead of, because sometimes I think, I've had someone tell me before, like, well, you're, this is, you need improvement on this. Well, then the conversation's over and done. And I'm like, oh, yeah. hey, what am I supposed to do about that? So I, I love that idea. Um, how about if you were coming in as a new administrator and I have received fives my whole life, I've just done a fabulous job and all of a sudden I get threes. Um, what would you do in a situation like that where you're, you're the a new administrator and all of a sudden you have to set this bottom line or set this precedent of evaluations? And so you're saying that the employees, I just gave this employee threes? Right, like I've done okay. fives for the last 10 years. You all of a sudden, you're, you're a new administrator to me, you're a new dean to me, and all of a sudden I got threes. Um, you know, how do you how do you kind of backlog that from from someone who's used to getting really great scores but maybe doesn't deserve those scores? Yeah, now that's where I just going when you said that you hit right on the the, the head on the, on the nose or nail or whatever is that they may not deserve that. So there was never they probably never had a conversation of why they were achieving those five. So that's where I would start. They come in if I gave them threes and they're just like, what in the world? I've been blah, blah, blah. and like, well, here's here's the way I evaluate. So first I tell them here's Here's how I evaluate, and here's what I see, and here's where I see you. We need improvement. I always like to use we. I don't like to ever usually put you or me. We, that's where it's a team kind of effort. So I think the biggest thing in that is be able to explain 
Because if you can back up what you're saying uh, with with your logic, or here's how I did it, I graded it this way, I was able to to uh, evaluate on these items, and and this is where you fail. You didn't achieve where I wanted you to. So I think as long as you're able to back it up and not, <laughs> your biggest mistake would be because. <laughs> Because I said so. Because I said so. <laughs> We're done. All right, that's great. Um, I think that hits the majority of our outlines. So I usually just end with a couple of conclusion um, questions. Unless you have anything else you want to offer from from a leadership perspective, I'll kind of give you an option to you know give your advice if you've learned over a lifetime. But is there anything specific to the objectives or anything we've talked about today that you want to add or that you want to throw in there? I, I think we pretty much hit on. I think the the biggest key things are don't pretend what if you're not something because people can see right through that. And um, in, it truly to I guess to be a leader you have to have followers. And so to be a true leader, those people have to want to follow you. You can have authority by yep I'm the name so whatever I say you got to do. But that doesn't mean they're going to be a follower or I'm a true leader. So I try and work with the people under me. And then I don't even like to say underneath me. To me, I see us as a team. So man, that might be my leadership philosophy is as a college, we're a team. Where do you want to go? I'm, I'm going to help us get there. It's, and I always use, like I mentioned before, we. And so, um, so I find our mission statement. I go back to our mission statement all the time. What, well, as a college, there's what we're, our goal is. And so how... So everything we do or what we do or how we get there should be able to go back to that, that mission statement. So a lot of times we have our, I usually have two meetings, big meetings of everybody in the fall and spring and, and, and revisit that mission statement. That's our goal. Are we achieving that? Or do we need to change that? Because things change. So we need to reevaluate it too. So, so kind of that's your focus. And then don't pretend that you're something you're not. People see right through it because you want to be a leader. They want to know they can trust you. That's another big thing is, trust. So if you say you're going to do something, you better do it or follow through on your policies. Cause if they know that person's getting fives and they shouldn't, that's not going to carry very much weight. Or if you favor, you kind of act favored to one group, give favoritism to one group or the other people like that, either try and spread it out to, and, uh, and, and get to know everybody. People want to know that you know them or and that's, and that's the way you learn. What are their strengths? What are their weaknesses is get in there and, and know people. And, and visit with them. And then I think a big thing too from if administration is tell people that they are doing a good job. A lot of times, the only time they hear it is, you're sucked up this and you need to pick up, start marching a little faster and doing this. So, it, I mean, we have to do that too, but we forget to say, man, you, you did a good job on this or as a whole, as a group or anything. And a lot of times I even start off like my chair meetings. I know, I know you think this is corny, but you guys are really doing a good job. And it, it resonates somewhere in there that they need, they like to hear that people, we all do. So, and then the I think, time mentors. I think that's a great point. And I think sometimes um, I had the experience the other day, I was on a flight back home to Iowa and it's the middle of the flight and the flight attendant approached me and she's like, Mrs. Cowan. And I'm like, I'm like, yeah, what? You know what I mean, I'm like, I'm like, Ooh, they want me to duct tape someone to a chair. I'm your girl. I got you. Uh, <laughs> but it was, it was nothing that dramatic. It was just, she looks at me and she's like, we'd like to thank you for traveling with us. And th that was it. And like, it was sincere. It was authentic. Yeah. And then like, I lay back in my seat and I'm like, I just got played by like, like <laughs> she looked me in the eye. She called me by name. She told me good yeah. job. And so like, even though I knew that those are some of the oldest tricks in the book, it still felt good. You know I mean, does. like I, I still like hearing that. And so I think you forget, like I attend so much leadership training, so many webinars. And like, so every time I want to tell someone they're doing a good job, I'm like digging through that proverbial toolbox yeah. of, you know what I mean? What can I do or what can I say? And you just, a very simple, yeah, thank you, or good job. It it still does feel good. I know I was like, and so sometimes it doesn't have to be any more than that, but somehow we we create that it has to be more than that. So yeah. I like that. I like that idea of it. Um, so how about something that you are most grateful for in life? I guess that that my upbringing, I would say, um, and uh, kind of. <laughs> My, I should say my folks got divorced when I was really young. So my influence for my grandparents out in Iowa, I, I got to the farm and I think that influence of the hard work 
and, and grinding out that, I guess, just having that strong work ethic. That'll take you farther than, than all the PhDs or, or degrees in the world. If you can show me that you're going to get in there and grind and do the best job you can do, I'll take that over any day than, than a bunch of papers and, and uh, th someone thinks they're perfect. So I think that just that work ethic that, man, I'm going to keep getting up. I get knocked down, I'll get back up. I'm going to try and, and we're going to be successful. I think that's a, that's probably the, the biggest thing of my grandparents that, that they instilled that in me. Well, I like that because I was raised in the Midwest too. And there was no, um, like you got up and you went like you were go, go, going, And that's, and that's what you did. And that was the expectation. Yeah. You know? no, so, <laughs> no, no, that was expectation. Um, how about, um, my last question to you is if you have a saying you live by, do you have something that you live by or something that if you're in a, if you're in those grinding moments and you need something to kind of get you through, what, what do you say to yourself or what do you, what do you think about? I get, I got a couple. And the one that, that gets me through when I'm grinding is I usually have the a coach told me this once. It's called good, better, best. The good become better, the better become the best, and the best never rest. So when it gets hard and, and down, that's when you just dig deep. I guess that's that work ethic too. It's like, oh no, I'm not getting beat here. This this we're gonna even we're gonna we're gonna do this. And so you just keep digging, keep digging. So that's kind of my my model that keeps me going and keeps trugging. And then, uh, then kind of on the reward side, that's the old famous cliche of work hard, play hard. I think if you balance both, then you then you can. It's a all your hard work pays off because then you know I'm going to be rewarded with this. And then, and then the other one that doesn't really have to do with how it gets me through, but I like to tell some of my coworkers or, or even people that work under me, if if I have to do your job, what do I need you for? So it's like, so do your job. <laughs> Let's do this. <laughs> I, I love all of those. Mine is you're either winning or learning. You know what I mean? And so I tell people the same thing. Like often I get this perception like, oh, you have a PhD. I'm like, you know what all of my education has taught me in my whole life is that I know nothing. <laughs> That's what it basically taught me is yep. that I, there's so much more to learn. There's so much more to do. There's so much more to work towards yeah. um, when you get that. So, so I like that analogy too. So, all right. Well, I just want to thank you for taking the time and, and hanging out with me today and having leadership conversations. I, I really, really appreciate it. So thank you so much for taking the time. Oh, thank you. It's so much fun to, to get to visit with you. And as Mary said before, we've known each other a long time. She's one of my very first students a million years yeah. ago. Yeah, <laughs> you're supposed to say, yeah, you're supposed to say you're most grateful for the Iowa Central X-ray class of 2002. That's what you're supposed yeah. to say for the mo what you're most grateful for in your life. Yeah. That's what I'm most grateful for. <laughs> they, they put me on this journey. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, bye-bye.